My name is Scott Santons, and uh, I live in New Orleans, Louisiana. And uh, I came to the idea of basic income back in 2013. And uh, I started researching the idea back then as a potential solution for a potential future of a lot of unemployment due to automation. And even this idea of how technology should work for us. It should everyone benefit or should just a few people benefit? I feel that technology should be working for us. So I came out this idea of basic income from this idea from the future. But in studying it, I came to realize that this is not just a solution for tomorrow. This is a solution that we should have actually adopted decades ago. This is something that we need to do immediately due to just how many positive effects they would have across a, a very wide range of measures. So I've just started devoting my life to really getting this idea out there. I think of myself as kind of a, a popularizer of the idea to explain it in terms that people can better understand because for the longest time it's been more of a academic conversation. It's uh, you know, kind of more into uh, more ingrained in, in philosophy instead of kind of everyday language, understanding, uh, perspectives. So that's really something I've been focusing on. And also, I've actually crowdfunded my own basic income. So since January of 2016, I've been living with a basic income of $1,000 per month. So this has actually really helped me to understand it from a personal perspective. It's not just something that I'm talking about and saying that, that I think this is a good idea because of my various theories and research. I understand it's a good idea because I live with it and I feel the effects of it and I know that it works. And I think people entirely underestimate what this idea is capable of. Oh, the idea is definitely growing in popularity in the US. And this is a conversation that is growing worldwide and there's actually a feedback mechanism going on. So let's say Switzerland is a good example where Switzerland really put this on the map, I feel, again, worldwide with them voting on it. And so the fact that a country was voting on basic income for its citizens really kind of excited the world. People going, uh, what are they doing? What is this idea? I've never heard of this before. And oh my gosh, what would that do? So it really got people thinking about this. And that got other countries thinking about it. And of course, other countries get interested in it. And then they start thinking about, well, let's do a pilot project. You know, let's study this. And then that gets sent around the world as far as the, the media uh, talking about this idea. And so as it gets more popular in one country, then that can actually help grow this momentum around the world in other countries. So that's how it is in the US as well, where the US started to consider it more because of Switzerland, because of Finland experiments, because of Canada talking about it. But it's also the different countries are talking about it from different perspectives and reasonings. So. Whereas Finland is looking at this from a how to uh, allow people or enable people to take more part-time work, uh, how they should you know, reform the welfare system in a way that encourages work more. That's their way of looking at it. Canada is essentially looking at it from more of a poverty prevention perspective. Uh, and the US is really concerned about the technology angle, this idea that with the automation of work, um, if estimates are correct as far as in 20 years that we're going to have half as much employment as we do now, uh, what do we do? What kind of future are we looking at? What kind of policy options do we have? So that's the conversation that's driving this in the US and it, it really is becoming more discussed, uh, especially as bigger and bigger names come out in support of it. Uh, like it was a big deal when Elon Musk came out in support of it. Uh, it was a big deal with Mark Zuckerberg coming out and endorsing it. Most recently, Hillary Clinton said that she almost ran on it uh, for president in 2016. Uh, these, are, these are big names in the US. And it's interesting how just a, a few years ago, that wasn't you know, the case. It wasn't really something considered to be having even a potential. Like I remember, when I first started getting into this idea, there was a, a, uh, a common response was, sure, that's a great idea, but 
you're not going to have any like rich people. You're, no billionaire is going to support this because they're going to be uh, they're going to be net payers into the system. Like they're not going to benefit from it. So why would they ever support it? Now you've got all these billionaires coming out in support of it. Some of the richest people in the world, and people are saying, "Oh, well, sure, the billionaires support it <laughs> because they're the ones who are going to benefit from it." So it's just funny how how they can how you can uh, kind of look at what's going on and it can like be be twisted and people can think of it uh, you know the the opposite of whatever's going on at the time that it's going on like it, you can come up with all sorts of justifications for and against it uh, but the fact that you've got these really big names coming out for it uh, is something new and uh, I'd also say too that in the US as far as this goes we actually almost passed a version of this uh, under Nixon back in uh, 1969 he proposed something called the Family Assistance Plan and this was something that I didn't know as well until I started researching this idea. Uh, I was shocked to see that we had actually had a president that proposed it, that it had passed the House of Representatives and that it didn't get through our Senate but if it had it would have been signed by the president and gone into law and here the US would have been the first country in the world to guarantee an income. That would have set a precedent that could have had global effects. We could have been looking at an entirely different present right now than what we have if that had happened. That uh, the US actually spent a lot of uh, time and money actually looking into, the, looking into this idea with experiments. So we did experiments in Seattle and Denver and Gary, Indiana and North Carolina. Uh, we looked into this across a wide range of you know, rural, metro. We looked into this as far as the amounts and the clawback rates, uh, as far as the uh, negative income tax version went. We really looked into this idea. And uh, there's still interesting data to, to look at and, and learn from. But uh, it's almost like I see that we're coming around like full circle again. Like if you read the history of what led up to Nixon proposing it, and the experiments that went on uh, and how we almost passed it. I think we're seeing that again. And I think that here in the US that, uh, that this time is highly likely that we could end up passing it this time. But it's just interesting how this could be thought of as something that was originating out of, out of the US that now is like coming back again. Well, yeah, they're, everyone, I, you know, my friends and family are, are very supportive. You know, it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a good example of, of uh, the kind of work that's possible with basic income. You know, it's, it's part of the future of work is about redefining what work is. And I think that for the longest time, we've been thinking about work as work that you do in exchange for money. That that's the only work that matters. It's the only work that's important or valuable because there's money attached to it. And I don't think that's true at all. I don't think that's the best work. I think if, you, if you're gonna look at what's the best work that's going on in the world, I think it's the work that people are doing for free. It's the, people, it's the work that people are doing because they're passionate about it. You don't do work that you love or that's really important only if someone pays you money. <laughs> you do it because it's important to you. And it, it's possible to earn money from that. Uh, just like, as with me, I'm able to pursue this work that I do. I'm able to research basic income. I'm able to write about it. I'm able to travel and talk about it because I have that time and ability and the passion to actually do this work. And I am able to earn money from this on occasion. Uh, let's say I'm able to sell an article here or there uh, but that's also an article that I really wanted to write, which I think is very different from your kind of typical perspective or typical situation where you're writing an article because you need to in order to live. <laughs> and maybe you're writing something that you don't necessarily care about. You know, maybe you're writing something that you don't even agree with, but you have to write it because you need money in order to live. And I think that really gets to this key of this transformation that is possible with basic income is that there's, just think right now, like just a question of 
what, what is it? What are people not doing right now because they don't start each month with enough money to live? You know, what is, what work? Just think of how much work is not happening because people don't have that ability. And I think that is a very powerful thing to think about. And that's not something that anybody can answer for other people. I don't know what the answers are, say, in the US. I don't know what 300 million people will be doing with their basic income. But I know that they know what they would be doing. And I guarantee you that there's a lot of people out there with a lot of great ideas, that there's a lot of passionate work that people want to do, a lot of meaningful work that they are currently prevented from doing that they could be doing with the basic income. And I know that because I have a basic income and I have that ability. I can control the, the work that I do. I have, I have that power, I have bargaining power. You know, if someone says, hey, Scott, we really want you to write this article for us and we'll give you $50 for it. <laughs> and I can say, okay, well, I don't really want to write that article. I'd actually rather write this article of mine. And I'd actually, write this other article that actually is more interesting to me. It's going to be a lot longer and it's going to take more time. And I actually am going to want to publish it for free <laughs> because I want more people to read it. Uh, the more people who read it, the better. And if you're offering me $50 for an article that I don't even own the rights to, that, that you're going to own it and I'm going to have to ask permission to even republish it, then why would I say yes to that? And just, just think about just how much work is going on right now in the other condition. You know, what are people doing that they, that they wouldn't do otherwise? You know, what, is it, what, are, what rights are they giving up? Uh, what topics are people covering? You know, just imagine like all the, the articles and the media and stuff that's going on right now that's being written just for money. In, in the US, a really interesting statistic I feel is that only one third of the US right now of workers are engaged by the work that they do. So it's funny to me when someone talks about the, the value of, of jobs and how important it is that people have a job and that, oh my gosh, if you have a base income, everyone will stop working. I think that's kind of ridiculous because on the one hand, they're assuming that people are extremely happy with the status quo. <laughs> But that's obviously not true because two thirds of people are entirely disengaged or partially disengaged by the work that they do. That's, that's a huge problem. And on the other hand, basic income in no way inhibits work. If you get a check in the mail for $1,000, that doesn't stop you from working. It doesn't stop you from taking your job. It doesn't stop you from employment. Or it doesn't stop you from taking a part-time job, part-time work. It actually better enables that. And as far as my experience goes, it certainly better enables unpaid work. That's something that I feel that in the future, as far as automation continues, and as far as machines are able to do more and more of our work for us, great. Like I think that's what machines should be doing. If, if a machine can do the work that a person does not want to do, then a machine should do that work. And if, a, if humans should be free to actually pursue the work that is most important to them, paid or unpaid. And no other policy enables that except for an unconditional basic income. That's what you need. That's the, the fundamental foundation to enable people to pursue the work that's most important to them. And this also concern that's out there as far as a basic income say, oh my gosh, you're going to have people only earning, say, $12,000 a year, and they're going to be miserable because that's all they have. First of all, I don't think that's true. I think most people are going to be earning income on top of that income through their normal jobs or through part-time jobs or through various tasks and other forms of labor. But at the same time, I feel that, so when it comes to basic income, I think there's, uh, there's, a, there's a foundational argument that I think a lot of people are assuming because it's part of the system. It's, it's a system that we've all been born into. It's a system that's gone on for, for many hundreds of years. And because we're born into this system, we just accept it 
as the way things are and even the way things should be because people just assume that the way things are are the way things should be. But I think that if we go back, and this is more of, a, of an argument that say like Thomas Paine discussed, but if we go back all the way to when private property was first created, so just imagine, imagine a, a bare earth where the first people are and somebody gets the idea that they can draw a circle around a big part of the land and say, that's mine. So this is, if you look at the earth, this is a giant rock floating through space <laughs> among many, 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 it's just a small speck in a grand universe. This is one speck with a couple specks on top of the speck. And one speck is saying that this is mine. And of course that excludes the other people. And so if you look back at that moment when the very first person called the earth theirs, that actually stole from the other person. Because before that moment, the earth was owned by everyone or by no one. At that moment, one person laid claim to the earth. And the other person is forced to do the bidding of the other person in order to live. So that's the situation that we have. That's what we consider normal, is that you're born onto the earth and you have to pay to live here. That doesn't make any sense to me. And I feel that, that this is really a foundational reason for basic income, and this is what I'm really pushing for, to live in this world where you don't have to pay to live on it. Because we were all born here. I feel that we all together own the earth or none of us own it. But either way, no one should be forcing another person to work for them in exchange for money to live on it. I think that's wrong. And I think the unconditional basic income finally resolves that issue that goes back before all of this really started. I feel that essentially for most of human history, we built this entire civilization without a foundation. That foundation is basic income. And I think that once we create that, we as a civilization will be capable of so much more than what we have currently accomplished and what we think we're capable of.